Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the Dot Com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. I have a fascinating show today. You know, if you watch the Dot Com Magazine show regularly, you know that we love technology. We love also health. And we love entrepreneurs that bring something new to the market that is very powerful and very important. And we've been able to invite on the show today an MD, and his name is Dr. Elliot Justin. And of course, he has been an emergency medicine specialist for a number of years, and he has a company called FirmTech. And when you hear what it does and you hear about the technology behind it and what he loves and what his passion is to help men in really sexual health issues, it's very, very fascinating. It definitely caught our attention. He really has the world's first smart male underwearable company. I mean, when you hear what it is and what it does, it's going to be very fascinating. And of course, health, all kinds of health, whether it's emotional health, physical health, sexual health is all very important. They're all tied together. And we're going to get into all that with Dr. Justin. But Elliot, welcome to the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thank you. It's good to be here. All right, here we go. You've got a great, great product. I mean, it's so interesting. But before we ask all the questions and get into, you know, this passion that you have to help men, let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet. Tell us about FirmTech, and then we're going to get into it. Certainly. Uh, our mission at FirmTech is to help men achieve a lifetime of lovemaking. Our focus is in pioneering products for the prevention, management, and treatment of erectile dysfunction. Products that will help men and their healthcare providers with those three elements. Also, our products are designed to enhance performance, so they'll benefit all men, not just, just, not just men with, with ED. Yeah, I love it. I love it so much. And of course, there's so much science behind this. I mean, Science shows that regular sexual activity can lead to a 50% reduction in mortality. It can lower the risk of developing prostate cancer by 33%. And of course, can reinvigorate, you know, people's minds and bodies and really reduce the risk of vascular disease. So let's talk about that because, of course, you've been an emergency room doctor for many, many years, and you're, you're passionate about helping people. And in this particular case, you're helping men. So this device that you have, how does it work and how did you come up with the, with the idea? Sure. So, uh, you know, working in the, in the ER, I'm very aware of the common emergencies. Well, for men, one of the most common emergencies and most large emergencies is erectile dysfunction. So before there's dysfunction, there's fitness. And that's what we want to emphasize. How, do you, how does a man maintain his erectile fitness? In order to do that, we need some ways of objectively measuring what that is. So first, we embedded sensors, strain gauge and a presser gauge, in, in an erection ring, more commonly known as a cock ring. But we wanted to have a cock ring that was more user-friendly than anyone else's because we want to eliminate the, well, the embarrassment that can be associated with using cock rings, with having to need a cock, cock ring. You don't mind my using the phrase cock ring, do you? Rather than erection ring, because, okay, thank you. So embedding these sensors into a cock ring, we both give men uh, a device that can enhance their performance, and I'll show you ours in a moment, how it, how it accomplishes that. But we can measure four parameters that, have not, that people have not been able to measure in privacy without staying overnight in a clinic, et cetera. And these four parameters are indicative of a man's vascular health of his erectile fitness. The first parameter is, are, is to count the no number of nocturnal erections. So a, a, a young man, 20, 25 years of age, might have five to six nocturnal, erect, nocturnal erections per night while they're dreaming. I'm 69. Uh, in my age, it should be three or four. So if that number goes down, if I went from, I'll pick on myself, if I went from a four to a one, I'm in trouble. I, I, I likely have vascular 
of vascular disease and I need to see a doctor. What do men do today when they have ED? They go online and they get pills because they're embarrassed. And one of the messages I do want to convey to the listeners here is that you have, if you have ED, there's a high, it's not just due to anxiety. There's a likelihood that it's due to vascular disease. And if it persists, you really should seek the help of, help of a physician. But we can't, we're counting three other parameters. One is the force of an ejaculation. Two is firmness. And three is the duration of an erection. So all these things are, 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 unlikely, are likely to be a reflection of someone's vascular health or could be due to anxiety state. I mean, the, the, the causes of ED are multifactorial, but it's not just anxiety and alcohol. There can be serious con conditions underlying it. Uh, so the second thing we've done is change the, the, the cock ring. So I'm going to show you right now. This is, this is the leading competitor's cock ring. It's hard plastic. It's not particularly flexible. And it's not that easy to put on. So you have to take a, a little tiny rubber band. I don't even know if you can see it. Put it over one end here. This can, this can, this can, these put, then put, be put on over the penis. You have to stress this rubber band out. Uh, and, then the, and the rubber band can easily twist. This is, I, I've tried this myself. Does it maintain erection? Yes, it does. It's very uncomfortable though. And my wife's reaction to it was, take that thing off. So many men with erectile dysfunction are overweight, they're diabetic, or they're hypertensive. So add in someone being 25 pounds overweight who can't see his penis as a consequence, put some lube on his fingers, give him a cocktail or two to drink because he wants to get his courage up. This is a very difficult device to put on. Undoubtedly, it's just developed with good intentions. I don't, I'm not criticizing on that basis. And it is effective, but it's hard to put on. Uh, I challenge my design team of urologists and bioengineers to come up with a fresh form for a cock ring. And here it is. So what's, what's great about this? It's stretches. What a man does is doesn't need, to, doesn't need, doesn't need to see his private parts. And another great advantage of this device is this has to be put on before sex. This you can put on an hour or two before sex, before dinner, before, before you go out. Matter of fact, the, the, the first tester of this said, this feels so good, I never want to take it off. So it's made out of a soft elastomer. Most sex toys or sex aids are made out of hard silicone. They're not that comfortable, especially not particularly comfortable on sensitive body parts. This can be put on easily by a man or a partner. The, essentially, the testicles get dropped into this loop. The loop is then hooked. And so the, the penises go through one end, the testicles are coming out to the other end. Because of this design here, this, it can be cinched to make it tighter or loosened depending on what, what, you know, what personal preference is. Uh, one size fits all. Um, I, there aren't that many men this big as we, as we all know. So, uh, and it's very easy. This is very, very easy to, uh, to use. It's effective. I mean, it, we did a, in, in our consumer survey, I expected to inc inc increase the duration of erection, but 50% of the men in the survey said their orgasms were better. Now that was, that took us back. Now it's, it's not better like a vibrator is better for a woman, but it's better. Oh, you know, it's, it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll draw an analogy. You can have a hamburger with ketchup on it, or you can have a Wagyu steak with chimichurri sauce. So that is, is, is firm tech. Is that, and that we call this the, the performance ring. We yeah, that's amazing. I mean, that's really, really interesting right there, of course. You know, you're really dedicated to, you know, to men's health. And when I think about it, you know, when somebody's having a challenge, you know, with their sexual fitness, let's call it, is what you call it, then can you sort of think about there's some other challenges and there's some other problems perhaps in that person's body that they, they need to get checked out for? So, for example, is this a leading indicator of other health issues? And I would think that what you're doing is really saving lives because 
once they have a problem in this one particular area, I would imagine that it's indicative of some other problems throughout their body. That's correct. So there are so many things that, that men take, especially as they get older, that can impact on one's performance, on one's erectile fitness. Men take antihypertensives, antidepressants, anti-anxiolytic medications, a whole, a whole slew of other, other medications. Right now, we don't know what the impact of those things are on, on men's erectile fitness. At least we don't, we're unable to quantify them. With this, you'd be able to quantify it. So like, if, if I was going to be started on a blood pressure medication, I could then say, well, gee, is that medication having an impact on my erectile fitness? We could also, um, with this device, one can also determine how much alcohol is a game changer for me. So, hey, uh, it's, it's your birthday and you're going out with your partner. Uh, you could actually say, you know, you, you could actually say, you know what, that fourth cocktail, if we're going to make love tonight, that's, that's a mistake. And what's, the other thing this, this, this can answer is the age-old question of what goes, you know, in, in troubled sexual relationships is, is it my partner or is it me? Because if, if, if a man is having uh, a sufficient number of nocturnal erections at night but can't perform, look, there's a problem There's a problem in the relationship. Vice versa for the partner, it can be, can be reassuring as well too because it could be, oh, well, I'm not going to put an hour worth of effort into this because it's not going to happen anyway because you're, you're only having one nocturnal erection or zero nocturnal erections per night. So it really is a, uh, a game changer in how, in how we assess erectile dysfunction. The other value for this, though, is it has to is would be maintaining erectile fitness. So, if we're going to be taking medications, supplements, exercise regimens that are going to allegedly improve our sexual performance, we now have the ability to actually measure whether that whether that's occurring. Yeah, it's really interesting. Let's talk about the science just for a minute. Let's talk about the research. Let's talk about the technology. You showed us the the device now. For a man that wants to know where they're at, is there a device that has some technology implanted in it, or is that the next evolution of what you're going to be bringing out? No, we have two devices. We have a firm tech performance ring, which does not have technology. It's just a superior erection ring. And then we have the tech ring, which is currently finishing beta testing. I can tell you it's been really reassuring and interesting for me to see that, oh, I have four nocturnal erections per night. Uh, I can sustain erection that much. He has the power of my. So the, the information is really valuable. So this is the sensors are built into this. There's a strain gauge and a, and a pressure sensor. We have a phone app as well too. So um, after a session of sex or after sleeping for a night, one can pull up on the phone app uh, graphs that will tell you how well you performed. So yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, when you think of the technology, it's fantastic. And you have leading technologists working on that as well. Let's talk about sort of sexual health, because it's it's one of those things that people don't like to talk about. You know, we're bringing it out into the open here, you know, with you as one of the leaders in the field, Elliot. How important is sexual health for men and women in terms of their overall health and, and the way in which they look at the world and the way in which they sort of have their bodies moving in the right way? Well, it's, it's extremely beneficial. I mean, I, 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 people, men who have sex more frequently have less issues with depression. They have more satisfying relationships. They, their blood pressure is positively impacted. Uh, they, they have less depression. Um, I mean, it, their, their, their immune systems are stronger. There's hardly a system in the body other than maybe skin that's not improved or sustained by having a, a, a you know, satisfying sexual, sexual life. Yeah, that's interesting. And of course, you know, so many men, we'll, we'll focus on the men now, we're interested in our health. I mean, you know, we're wearing gadgets and we're looking at our heart all the time and we're working out and we want to know what's happening with our pulse rate. And, you know, we're wearing wearables and we're watching our, you know, food intake and our salt and our sugar and everything else. But one thing you've been able to do through your technology is really add an important component to a man's overall health sort of synopsis to their overall health regime. Is that sort of the idea behind it? That, that's correct. I mean, 
I'll ask you a rhetorical question, Andy. What do men care about more? How many steps they took yesterday or their erectile fitness? <laughs> every man, every woman knows what, they, what, what they're doing. So we're really delivering vital signs for a man's most vital organ. It's like having an EKG and blood pressure machine for one's erectile fitness at home that can be used in privacy without appointments, without, without prescriptions. Now, with re I'm sorry, Doc, pardon me. With regard to the technology, to, to the technology, technology wearable, how often does that get worn to give the feedback to the app? Um, how often should a man wear that? Well, we, we haven't determined that yet, but I'll, I'll speak for myself. I have, I have borderline high blood pressure. I take medication every, every few days, every, to me, every, every other day for it. Uh, I take my blood pressure, um, oh, probably three or four times a month. I would probably, I would, I've been doing the same thing. This, I'm actually, because I'm, because I've been testing it, I've been using it pretty much every night. Uh, and so I, I would imagine for a man after the age of 50, it would be valuable to measure your stat, status of your erectile fitness a couple of times a month. I think for young people, it's different. I think people, younger people are into wearables. And as you mentioned before, we call this the world's first underwearable. Uh, people can, can quantify and gamify, if they like, the, the data of, the, of their sexual performance. Uh, you know, my, my daughter, who's 27, speculates that in a year or two, uh, men are going to have to put this on their, on their dating sites. Women, it's not going to be enough just to, to uh, make seven-figure income and drive a Porsche and have multiple homes. Women are going to want to know what a man's score is, and men are going to want to also let people, let partners know that their scores are good. Well, that's an interesting outlook for sure. sure. Now, Dr. Justin, when we think about it, you know, with your background as an emergency medical specialist, what other areas do you feel are sort of key areas, you know, in, in health? You know, you've seen so many people sick, you, you've treated so many people. What's the area right now that you would say is the most important thing for our viewers to sort of focus in on? Is it sugar intake? Is it their diet? Is it exercise? What's the thing that could make the biggest difference for our viewers right now? Well, we, we live in obese times. And, uh, you know, a third of the adult population in the United States, and we're not alone, this is worse in Mexico and some other places, but a third of the adult population is diabetic or pre-diabetic. 25% or more of the population has hypertension. Uh, perimenopausal and postmenopausal women have all the same issues that men do. So it's... It, it's imperative for people to be aware of their blood pressure, to be aware of their blood sugar or the hemoglobin A1C. Uh, and people need to, people need to exercise more, get out. I mean, the, the lockdowns have really been hard uh, on, 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 on health. Uh, and it's important people to exercise, support people to, to avoid carbohydrate rich foods. It's also important for people to make love more. It's not enough, you know, it's not enough to be spontaneous. Spontaneity doesn't necessarily work. It's important for people, to my mind, to plan for pleasure, given all the benefits that sex can have for their lives. Yeah, I like that. And of course, on your website, you talk about everybody says, you know, don't smoke, exercise daily, eat a low fat, low calorie diet, you know, get seven hours of sleep and I don't abuse alcohol or other drugs, you know cultivate emotional closeness with friends and family. But then you say there's one more recommendation that you, the doctor, you know, must add to the list. And what you say is to make love regularly. It's very interesting. It's hard to ask the question, but are there regenerative powers of, of sex? Uh, I'd just be speculating, frankly, and if I, if I offer that, certainly it's regenerating to one's spirit. Uh, as, as to whether you can actually regenerate damaged, uh, cardiac tissue or damaged, you know, kidney function. I, that I, I, I don't know. I don't know about, it. I'd like to make, I'd like to be able to make that claim, but that would require significant research. Interesting. Uh, everyone knows that if they make love, they feel better. Yeah. Now, Dr. Justin, one thing on your website that I found was just really great is, you know, uh, the people around your, you know, technology platform, they call you the ringmaster. And I think that's really interesting. 
Let's talk a little about it just a little bit more. Where are we at in the process? In other words, you know, I go on firm tech. Am I able to buy, you know, the firm tech technology right now? Am I able to buy the ring? Where am I at with regard to the process of your product? Certainly. We are, uh, as of uh, this coming Monday, we will be selling the firm tech performance ring online. Uh, the firm tech tech ring, which is the ring that has the sensors, is still completing beta testing. Uh, we are expecting to receive the first shipment of them uh, in early May. Uh, they will then undergo another probably 10 business days of testing and people should be able to order it by the, certainly by the third week of May. That's great. Yeah, that's great. I'm sure it's gonna be, uh, there's gonna be just a lot of people interested in, in this, you know, erectile fitness, which is what you, you know, need to think about before erectile dysfunction. Now, I want to talk about your interest in what I call regenerative fitness or regenerative medicine. Where did that passion for you, doctor, come from? Where Did that start when you were a young man or something happened later in life? Uh, it's really something happened later in life, that, especially when it came to re regeneration, this area. In 2015, I sold an emergency medicine company called Pegasus Emergency, emergency Group. Uh, and I'll share with you also that I'm a uh, passionate and sometimes reckless horseback rider. I sometimes have this illusion that I'm a centaur, that I'm actually one with my horse. And I was riding in a place nearby where I live in Montana called Paradise Valley. Uh, and someone had cut a tree that had fallen across the path, but you couldn't ride underneath it. And I was in a particularly exuberant mood, probably going full out around 35, 40 miles per hour, uh, and too late saw this trunk. Uh, regretfully, I wasn't wearing plate armor. I didn't have a shield with me. Uh, so I shattered that tree with my ribs and my spine. So I broke six ribs and six vertebrae. Uh, and as I was uh, lying on the ground, uh, since I'm a rigid physician, I checked my airway. I, I made certain that I had, had ruptured my spleen. I hadn't punctured a lung. I was in a lot of pain. But everything seemed intact. And there's something that is not taught and should be taught to every man or every woman. I call it the cock-up sign. If you can cock up your big toe, then you'll be able to make love and also urinate, defecate, you know, other, other, you know, obviously important, you know, functions. So, so even though, even though your spine might be broken, your spinal cord has not been damaged, but that inspired me to, to think, well, what, what if, what if, what if I wasn't that lucky? What happens to all people who aren't that lucky? And what, and what about men with, with multiple sclerosis or, or a whole series of other diseases that can interfere with us, with, with their sexual performance? So my, my thought was, why can't we neuromodulate that is plant an electrode or stimulate the cavernous nerve, which is everyone's favorite nerve they never heard about? It's the nerve that produces orgasms in men and women. I um, tried this on myself with, with the help of a urologist. We implanted an electrode and it didn't work. I mean, the goal was basically have the equivalent of a cardiac pacemaker because that's an implanted electrode in the heart, but a cardiac pacemaker for human sexuality, which would be profoundly powerful and, and valuable, especially with an aging population. But it didn't work. And, but that, that kind of kept my interest in this space uh, and then eventually networked me to, to, to this. I, I, you know, there's, a doc, there's a Dr. James O'Talling, a urologist, an academic urologist at the, at the University of Utah, uh, and his concept was, there, is, there, there are 10, 15 papers that basically say that your vascular, that the penis is like the canary in the coal mine of vascular disease. And you all just commonly say that. And that the number of nocturnal erections is indicative of, of a man's vascular health and also pre predictive of treatment for erectile dysfunction if that man has erectile dysfunction. My thought was to, to take, um, and he was working with a strain gauge, uh, my thought was, so well, let, let's, let's add a, a pressure sensor. So we now have two sensors looking at this, this problem. And let's take, uh, let, let's put it into a double cock ring. W why do we want to be double? By double, I mean that, that one loop is around the base of the penis, the other loop is around, is around, around the top of the testicles. We want to be double so there's no rotational artifact with the sensors. Uh, and also doubling it, doubling it actually 
or what does it, let's talk about what does an erection ring do? So we don't want to block the arterial circulation, blood flow into the penis. We want to constrain the venous outflow. We want to retard its ability to get back. So we're actually looking for a soft tourniquet effect, not something tight, but something soft. And with that soft tourniquet effect, uh, we now have the form. So if we embed, so we have this form that can, that, uh, can enhance pleasure, but we also have a form in which we can embed the technology. So the technology, the, 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 the technology is embedded in this piece. There's a, there's a memory chip, a uh, battery, the sensors, uh, the battery life is eight to 12 hours. And this communi- and this communicates after you take it off and put it back into the charger, it communicates by Bluetooth with, well, your computer, your phone, you know, wherever, wherever, you, wherever you want to send the information. The Bluetooth is off while you're having sex, while you're sleeping, because we don't want to expose people to even that minimal amount of radiation. Wow, what a fascinating journey. I mean, you you love horses, you're out riding your horse and had an accident, and then you said to yourself, well, maybe I can change the world. I mean, you're all in. You had a some type of a node embedded into your body to try and stimulate, you know, your uh yeah, uh, yourself, and then uh, it didn't quite work the way you planned. And then you said to yourself, "Well, there has to be a better way." And now you've come up with firm tech technology, working with some really fascinating and leading other, you know, physicians throughout the world in their respective fields. It's so powerful. I mean, I love it so much. What a great entrepreneurial story, um, Doctor Justin. Let me let me. I know you've only cut out a certain amount of time, and I really appreciate it very much. I know you're so busy, and you're about to get this big launch going with. Of course, the, the the technology of firm tech and and the one with the embedded you know um, technology in it. Let's talk about entrepreneurship just a little bit. You know, you you've been on an entrepreneurial journey here with firm tech. I mean, you're a very successful you know emergency medicine specialist. For the younger entrepreneurs watching the show, Doctor Justin, can you share some insight based on your experience bringing firm tech to market? to the younger entrepreneurs that are maybe hitting a tough time or hitting a roadblock and share with them some things about what they can do to get through those tough times as an entrepreneur. Well, you need to start young. I, I, I won't start with firm tech. I'll go back into my past. I founded my first emergency medicine company in 1988. And I've had three emergency medicine companies um, and they've all been successful. So, but, the, but you have to have a passion. So by the, pa- the passion that behind those companies, they're called Pegasus Emergency Group, was how do we deliver high quality healthcare without compromise and inspire physicians to work hard and effectively? So initially, I, my thought was, I'll just pay more money and I'll hire the best doctors. Uh, and then I realized that, no, it's actually, we have to actually monitor their productivity. We have to have doctors who are both have high customer satisfaction scores, but are also productive. Uh, and but I did it. Starting businesses is always always takes a risk. So I, I you know, I, I, when I started these emergency medicine groups, I didn't know anything about billing. Um, <laughs> billing is, really, really, is obviously really important in healthcare, uh, and I've made some mistakes. Um, you know, probably uh, I, I also founded a company called Swift MD, which is the second oldest telemedicine company in the United States, second oldest after, after Teladoc. Founded it way before um, telemedicine was, was a complex. I mean, when, when, in 2005, which when I was thinking about, about Swift MD, we did a consumer survey of pe- whether people would accept telemedicine. The survey said, no, don't do this business. But we did it anyway uh, because it made sense to me. If, we, if, we, if we're going to, Solve a healthcare problems. We take healthcare out of the ER to where to where you are, and we need to, as much as possible, try to uh, digitize healthcare uh, and empower people with knowledge that physicians should deliver if they weren't also motivated somewhat by, by secondary gain. But I'm digressing from what you wanted to say. I, 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 along with that, I, I started a company called Swift Vitals. So way before the Apple Watch, my interest was in take, getting the vital signs off the radial artery and the ulnar artery using sensors. Uh, and that this, and this is a lesson people, that company failed. It was an idea that was before it's, it's time. I still hadn't realized that you have to have, you don't want to start a business unless you have adequate money. I did not have adequate money. And then you can't 
often anticipate what's going to happen in the world. We just we've seen that we've seen that with COVID. With Swift MD, what well, it was well with the advent of Obamacare in 2007, 2008, Congress put a tax on new medical devices on the gross revenue of a company. Well, that really killed interest in uh, in part, the part of investors in investing in in, um, in wearable technology for for several years. It's come back in because Congress has subsequently you know, changed that idea. So when it comes to, you know, Fremtech is, is my, probably my know, sixth or seventh venture. Um, and I've been able to do this, take this from concept to commercialization in about a year and a half because of the experience that I've had. I've wasted money. I mean, I'm my third, we're on third software company, we're on a second hardware company. Uh, you will make mistakes. You have to have humility to be an entrepreneur too. You can't get too emotional about mistakes. You have to be accountable. You have to acknowledge errors. But your response has to be, response to bad decisions or missteps has to be tenacity. You have to proceed. And you always need to be asking yourself, what could go wrong? What am I not considering? And then, then there's the team. I'm, you know, I, I guess there are, you know, there, we all know about these geniuses, Jobs and Musk, who can do these, somehow seem to do these incredible things largely on their own. Well, uh, most of us are, are more limited in our abilities and in our ability to build teams. One of the fascinating things, and it can be alarming to entrepreneurs, is businesses burn relationships. You go into business with people you know, usually, friends, you raise money from family, you might even be involved in business with family, uh, and you might tell yourself, well, I'm not going to get involved with family, but often those are the, those are the people most people can rely upon the, the most, so you do. Uh, you know, in, in a marriage, you get makeup sex. In a friendship, this issue doesn't even doesn't even come up. In business, you either succeed with, a ta- with an assigned task and you end or you make money or you don't. Uh, and it's really easy to, for entrep- people and entrepreneurs to convert possibilities into probabilities and probabilities into certainties and then, hey, where's the check? So people really need to, I mean, entrepreneurs tend to have, I think, have a tendency to, to mythomania and enthusiasm. It's really important to continually be checking yourself about that. Be certain that you're actually weighing the risks. You also, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to need to be a CNO as well as a CEO. By CNO, I mean chief nagging officer. People don't get things done in a timely manner. People people like to do what they know how to do, or they feel good doing. And you, and you can have to, especially with a small team, you have to push people out of their comfort zones. Uh, in addition to which, if they're not incentivized or motivated, they're not going to want to work. They're not going to want to take your phone call on Saturday afternoon or Sunday, Sunday, Sunday evening. And there's money. Um, I, it's, you know, get, given both my successes and failures, it's so important to have adequate funds uh, and then to add in another 20, 25%. I'm certain you've heard this before, anybody. You know, you, you're going you're to need more money and more time. Than you imagine it's going to take. Uh, on the hand, you don't want. On the hand, as obstacles develop and as you zigzag your way to success, you don't want to be dismayed. That's normal. I mean, I, it, unless you're, you know, when I when I was starting emergency departments at Pegasus Emergency Group, the first one I had in my head, the second one I kind of had in my head, and the third one I realized I need to build a template. Now I need to get discipline. I need to plan. I need to have checklists. Uh, and those checklists need to be continually, continually revised. It's just, just so you know, d- disciplined organization is also uh, critical to success. And then you want to think, you want to assess the competition. Uh, what, what's, what's your value differentiator? And then you also want to be thinking about what the exit is. And you want to be fair to your investors. This this point I actually want to emphasize because I think a lot of entrepreneurs and investors have, have been burned. Uh, it's important. So, for example, with, with firm tech. What I, what I make is capped. So the investors know that when we start making money, we're not making money yet, we start making money, I, the, the people in the C-suite just can't suddenly start paying themselves lots of big, you know, big salaries, give themselves large benefits. We, I make my money in this company off the distributions. The investors make their money off, off the distributions. And the investors have to be respected. In many startups, the investors get disrespected. People work at something for five years and they think, well, where the investors been? I'm the I'm the one who's been working sixty hours a week. I'm the one who uh, wakes up four o'clock in the morning and stresses. But but why would anyone invest in a company 
if the company was going to dis- disrespect its investors, especially expect expect to raise more raise more money. Um, so that's uh, then 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 you, then you want to think about how do you want to pay people. So at firm tech, we're paying largely through distributions, and I don't think it's that common. Which you, it's more common for people to get you know get paid salary. I think distributions are, are highly motivating and fair though. Then you want to think about whether you want to exit. Is this, is this, a, is this a lifestyle business you want to run forever uh, if you achieve a certain degree of success? Or is this something that you want to sell? If you want to sell, who do you want to sell to? So with Pegasus Emergency Group, I really spent the last three years of that company speaking to, ex- to, to uh, exit buyers, finding out what, what, you know, what, what, what do you want? What do we need? How do we need to change what we're doing in order to satisfy you? So that's, I, I guess that's a lot of advice. <laughs> wow, Elliot, I tell you, for the people watching the show, I mean, rewind what Dr. Justin just said. He kind of gave you a Harvard MBA right there. I mean, that's really all the steps. Really interesting. I mean, I'm going to have to bring you back on the show, Elliot. I want to talk more yeah. about your entrepreneurial journey and your background. I mean, it's an honor to have you. I mean, I really look at you as one of the early pioneers in telemedicine as well as one of the early pioneers in wearables. And then, of course, now you've got the world's first underwearable. So you're really, you know, leading the charge. I love it so much. Dr. Justin, this has been great to have you on the show. Congratulations on what you're doing at Firm Tech, And it's just been a delight to have you. And thanks so much for coming on the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thanks so much. Look forward to talking again.